Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I am glad to welcome all of our faculty, students, guests, and speakers to the second annual Science Fiction Symposium at the New York City College of Technology. I would like to start off by thanking the School of Arts and Sciences at City Tech for hosting this event and professors A. Lavelle Porter and Jason W. Ellis for organizing this entire event and making it happen. So far in the event, we have gone over, um, we have gone through a few sessions consisting of several great papers and discussion panels, and we have come to the portion of the event where we will be given a keynote address by our honorary guest. In addition to this, our honorary guest, he will be taking questions, but I highly request that the questions be saved till the end of the hour. This semester, a few fellow students and I, students, Akeem Brijader, Pedro Roboto Vasquez, Luis Sanier, Leslie Vialta, and Moises Taveras, and I were studying in English 3403, which is an English class that has a subject of one major writer. Our class instructor, Professor A. Laval Porter, has revolved our class around the life and writings of a major writer and writings that inspired certain themes or characters within his writings to help us better understand the text. This major writer that we have learned about is Mr. Samuel R. Delaney. Samuel R. Delaney was born in 1942 and grew up in Harlem through a time of racial discrimination. Growing up dyslexic, Mr. Delaney had trouble with his writing, but by the age of 20, Mr. Delaney had completed his, his first novel, The Jewels of After. Mr. Delaney has written over 40 books thus far, having certain things from his life influence his works as well. He has also taught as a professor of comparative literature at the University of Massachusetts Amherst, Amherst, of English at SUNY Buffalo, and of English and Creative Writing at Temple University. In class, we have read some of Mr. Delaney's books, which include I and Gamora, Babel 17, which is a personal favorite of mine, and we have just completed Atlantis Model 1924. We have gone over an analysis of these works through different sessions as we were reading them and gone over certain writers that may have influenced some of his works, such as the poet Hart Train in the book Atlantis Model 1924. Being involved in Mr. Delaney's work, he does not fail to keep us interested in his works with the imagery and context that he uses. And at the young age of 75, he is still involved. With his long list of published achievements in this world, it is my pleasure to welcome our honorary guest to the podium, Hugo and Nebula Award winner and Grand Master of Science Fiction, Mr. Samuel R. Delaney. Contrastingly, adventures are based on those very rare situations where you have a problem and the thing you must do to solve it are usually a matter of having trained well enough at the gym and having had the bad guys indubitably pointed out 
so that by the time you need to beat them up and or arrest them, you have no problem knowing who they are or doubt that they deserve whatever you have to be allowed to them. When it leads to everyone except the vill villains living happily ever after with no collateral damage, well, this does not happen that often, if ever. The adventure is written for an ideal first reading. The French narrative, which isn't really French at all, is written for an ideal first reading and an ideal second rereading. What I would like to have done when I was giving the first version of this is to have pointed out 10 places in Zelazny's, Roger Zelazny's Nebula Award-winning science fiction novella, The Doors of His Face, The Lamps of His Mouth, starting with the title and its biblical resonance with the Book of Job. I will give you the passage in the Book of Job that the title comes from. Who can open the doors of his face? His teeth are terrible and round about. His scales are his pride, shut together as with a close feel, seal. Out of his mouth go burning lamps, and sparks of fire leap out. Where it was clear something was put in for the second reading, as well as the first. These were some of the underlinings I couldn't find when I was flipping through the text and I was all prepared to discuss how the last paragraph, along with the entire experience of having read the tale, changed my reading of the first paragraph on the second time through. But I ran out of time. We came close to doing that with our first discussion of the first paragraph itself, though I could have been clearer and more succinct. I'll leave it to you uh, to check both. Most of the time, if you handle real life situations as though they were actually adventures to be gotten through and go looking for something that will serve as a denouement and a resolution that will allow you to get the whole thing, wrap up the problem and forget it, you find you haven't even begun to set anything right and have just pissed off a lot of people who often you really care about because you didn't take the time really to understand their side or give them some real insight into understanding yours, etc., 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 instead of creating a dialogue and working together, uh, which is what Jean and Carl literally do at the end of the doors of his face, the lamps of his mouth, and why it's so moving. But to the extent you are a, quote, thinking person, unquote, you are left with things you keep returning to, keep thinking about. One giveaway that Zelazny's tale is not an adventure so much as a French-style narrative is that the climactic scene is not really the climax at all. Rather, the scene where Carl goes underwater and the great beast is nowhere about, but he relives his terrors of the last time he fought the creature, uh, which allows him to realize why his ex-wife must be allowed to have the same chance he did, even if in such a more in a much more skeletal scene, he must offer himself as the beast she must overcome by pushing the button. The climax is simply the symbolic completion of the story, rather than the resolution of the story itself, which was basically psychological and happened when he was diving alone. We will see the same pattern in the other French-style narratives, some of which we'll look at, such as Joseph Conrad's Heart of Darkness, and also Peter Jackson's film remake of King Kong, of an original film from 1933 and an earlier remake from 1967. I thought that was the best way to present something that many of you had actually seen. The passage from Job on Leviathan lends as many resonances to the films of King Kong as it does to the doors of his face, the lamps of his mouth. Conrad's Heart of Darkness is a primary example of a French-style novel written in English, or I should say French-style novella. It's no accident that Conrad's unacknowledged collaborator on the story was Ford Maddox Ford uh, of The Good Soldier, 
which has been called the greatest French novel written in English, uh, who guided Conrad, as if they did not guide each other, through the French complexities of Conrad's own story of Belgians and Englishmen in the Congo, 18 years before it was published. The tale starts out doing everything it can to make you expect an adventure. A man gives a night-long account of his leaving England and traveling to France to continue on to Africa, where he captains a boat upriver to rescue another white man, that man, who has vanished at the river's head among the natives. But from the very beginning, the book leaves numerous clues that it is not that that is not what the narrative is actually doing. At first, it appears that it is doing the traditional setup of providing a frame story, the way traditional genre fiction so often do. James's ghost, like Dave James's ghost story, The Turn of the Screw, or Wells's Protos SF novella, The Time Machine. Only something goes markedly off before the frame is completed, or more accurately, the frame is never completed. The characters in the frame are not given names, but only exist as types, even the narrator. A great deal of time is spent describing the civilized world he is leaving. Once he reaches the Congo, more time is spent on the delays and retardations of the trip than on the trip itself. There is anticipation, but it is an adventure without velocity. The encounter itself in the white fog at the head of the river, then the night on shore, and the retreat with the moribund Kurtz, and the vicious slaughter of the blacks by the pilgrims in the white smoke as they stand on the bank, seems confused and confusing. Only Marlowe and Kurtz have names in the story. But by a third of the way through, some readers will have picked up that Kurtz, at any rate, is simply not the most important character in the tale. Until we learn much more about him, he is kind of a literary MacGuffin. Every new character, secondary or tertiary, is still introduced as a type, as a profession, rather than as a named individual, such as Charlie Marlowe. Whether it's the accountant in Leopoldville, or the old knitter of black wool back in England, or even the old fool who wants Charlie to take the measurements of every white man's head whom he will meet there, if you explains when Charlie asks him why that he never sees him again, then never that he never sees him again, so that it doesn't appear too important as far as he says. But why would someone in the 1870s or the 80s want the measurements of all the white people's heads, uh, the people's head leaving for Africa, and then on top of it? be so lax and inefficient about procuring them, unless the inefficiency is the point. It is supposed, if it is supposed to suggest, is it supposed to suggest that he is a primitive anthropologist of the white race rather than the black? And that maybe these anthropological methods themselves are inefficient as well as the people employing them? and that anthropology itself grows out of some old, outdated notions of craniology, an interesting enterprise 50 years before, in the days when Charlotte Bronte was writing, but not with any life still left in them. It is all an observation of the present primitive without any attempt to distinguish history from myth. Conrad was as much aware of the primitive white ideas of craniology at the end of the 19th century as he was aware of the staggering inefficiency of the colonial program itself by the time he got back from his month in the Congo. The station master, the station master's nephew, the engineer, these are as much frame characters as the ones sitting around listening, listening to Marlowe on deck, how he has to change in order to live with them. Could that indeed be the major point, if not the theme, of the novella? Once I reread and reread the novella, I found it impossible to answer the question any way other than yes. Anthropology itself 
in later years was criticized as the study at Oxford and Cambridge you took in place of history. And that in reality was entirely about how to understand a primitive culture just enough to exploit and dominate it, mm. having nothing to do with respecting it. Indeed, only history could lead to real respect. Anthropology was the study of primitive cultures that were assumed to have no history, but only a primitive endurance without response to the events that happened to them in actuality, especially the treatment by their exploiters and oppressors. What Conrad is trying to do from the beginning uh, to pin down, uh, what Conrad is trying to do from the beginning is to pin down where these notions at work in Africa come from in white culture and how they propagate it through it into the primitive ones. As Chinua Achebe said, with both hostility and bewilderment, why are Americans and even the English today teaching this short novel as if it were about Africa? There are no blacks to speak of in it. Neither their culture nor any individual from them is pre presented in anything like a full portrait. At the best, even they are just types, and unlike the, and unlike the whites, the few who pass by comprise very limited cliches. An African queen, a couple of servants, types much more limited than the whites. In the words of Cabin Boy Billy, in Peter Jackson's remake of King Kong, who is reading Heart of Darkness on the boat and holds the novel up to the ship's black first mate, who is Billy's ersatz adopted father, one fa on, at one foggy moment on the deck. <laughs> this isn't really an adventure novel, novel, is it, Mr. Hayes? And handsome Evan Parks, who plays Ben Hayes, the most admirable man in the crew, notably more than the somewhat sleazy German, Captain Engelhorn, and whom the boy idealizes tells him, no, Billy, it's not. In that sense, the original 1933 King Kong is about Africa and how the forces brought, it, brought back from it will wreak havoc on civilization. At least it says so. The 2005 remake by Peter Jackson is not about Africa. Movies be movies because they are popular culture have to be more literal, uh, uh, and it says so in the full scene just before his death, Mr. K and it says so in the full scene just before his death, Mr. Hayes, Evan Park, Parks tells the hero, played by Adrian Brody, that he is was given a medical honor by France during the Great World War, but was denied any recognition in his own country, the USA. As well, the film was released in 2005, so there is simply no way in the film that a film about the capture of the Empire State Building by a great black giant must, uh, must be read at least uh, by some as resonating with 9-11, four years before. Even if the building is already in the hands of the enemy and because film worked differently back then, doesn't explode, in the, in the third act. Like Zelazny's doors of his face, the lamps of his mouth, the main characters of Jackson's King Kong is also named Carl. Though that, we will start out by thinking, is pure accident. One of the reasons I have always thought Jackson's King Kong was a great film is that if you look at the full version with the deleted scenes restored in place, it's clear from, first, from the first cut version, cut version that the film started out as an ambitious portrayal about the Great Depression of the 1930s when the original film was made. And that as the characters get closer and closer to come, their own and their own version of Heart of Darkness, and proceed to return uh, the beast to the heart of civilization, Broadway. It is a film about the way the commercial forces of entertainment 
as you get closer and closer to that heart, consume and swallow up all attempt at social relevance. And while there is no way you can swallow that the biggest, blackest male imaginable has not ravished but seduced the little blonde white woman in this version, quite a gutsy comedian in reality, but who only plays for the camera a silent, sad figure against the sunset. And what's more, the real black hero has accomplished that seduction not by waving around the biggest black cop in the Western world at the time, but rather by the director's planning to have him climb, climb and appropriate the director planning to have him climb and appropriate for himself what was then the biggest white one and has been successful at it so that he has already mastered it. Kong has climbed to the top and carried Anne there with his own big black hands. The script explains that in this version, the movie uh, of the movie, Jackson's, Faye Ray, was too busy to work with such bozos and simply won't dis do it. She's busy working on a picture over at RKO, that is, the original production under the uncredited director, Marion C. Cooper, which will make her famous and lift the film industry out of the depression doldrums that it slid into, largely through doing Wells as Citizen Kane and going on to do all to all but bankrupt themselves doing his next film, The Magnificent Ambersons, the first film put together with this level of thought. In Jackson's film, Anne gets the whole gets the role because not only is she a good film actress, but more important, she is coincidentally the same size, uh, Maureen, the, uh, as Maureen, the actress who was going to play the part before because Ray was busy making a film over RKO, RKO presumably the original King Kong, or the film that, in the alternate history universe, they are making instead while we get the real skinny on Carl Denham and the incredibly under-equipped and under-funded film that Jackson replaces it with. And she can fit into Maureen's dresses that have already been purchased before the intended star pulled out. If you want to take the appropriation allegory just a little further, by climbing the huge white dick, Kong has, in effect, given it a hand job. <clears throat> While it may not be as observant a film as Apocalypse Now, Jackson's King Kong is a much smarter film, and along with its self-reflexive running commentary, is quite observant enough. It starts out practically as a documentary on the times, focusing more and more on the theatrical, and only breaking through the lowest level, vaudeville, does the film fill up the screen in a mad bet cap screwball version, which could conceivably have made King Kong, even in the face of all the industry's excesses then and now, that it critiques and parodies. If we run over the crew of the venture, somewhere between an adventure and a commercial proposition, as in venture capitalism, wink, wink, nudge, nudge, Though it's redeemed by the fact that probably most people don't think that while they're watching any more than it's, don't think that while they're watching any more than they think it's supposed to be a serious parody of a commercial film trying to be a serious one, which finally works because it is techno technologically spectacular, let's just linger a moment on the crew as significant minor characters in good French novel style. Andy Serkis, who plays King Tom, also plays a cook on the boat. Equally clearly, he is asshole buddies, however far it goes, with the little Asian sailor he is clearly so close to on shipboard. They literally die in one another's arms in the film's restored scene, recreated by Jackson for his remake and also in the 30s style so that it might be seamlessly re-edited into the 1933 version uh, along the gorge of the Valley of the Nest of Spiders. Do I know what I'm saying? Writing this, you can assume that I do. 
It's also Jackson's way of telling us that it won't hurt to look at what survives of the deleted scenes in his version as well. The little white guys in their planes are as mad as hell, and they want it, that is, their big white cock, and, in, and incidentally, and Darrow, back. At the end of Jackson's film, there is a strange bit of hugger-mugger that cries out for interpretation. It is something I have never seen anyone mention. At the end of Jackson's King Kong, when the show that Carl Denham is putting on in the theater is running smoothly, in the mime on stage, the actors playing natives are wearing the natives' costumes from the original film, the original actors used in what was supposed to be the original African scene. Denham is supposed to be reproducing what happened in Africa on the stage for the New York audience. Jack Driscoll, Driscoll is looking for Anne and comes to the theater. And after reproducing the film, and is rather reproducing the film, Carl introduces the show with the actor as the hero, and clearly Anne Darrow will be playing her part as the victim of Carl. In the back of the theater, Driscoll makes a comment to Carl's assistant, bearing a real scar from the African fray across his cheek, that Carl unfailingly destroys everything he loves. We see the charade of Kong and the natives played out on the stage. To repeat, the skirts of the black dancers are identical to the ones the actors in the original movie wore in the scene they were, that were supposed to be real. And a woman in a white dress is chained between pillars and seen from the back with her head down. She raises it. We cut to her face and she screams the way Denim instructed Anne to do on the ship. But it is an actress in a blonde wig playing Anne who screams. In the back of the theater, Driscoll recognizes the imposture. What happened to Anne? Driscoll wants to know. He has come for her, of course. The assistant says, I don't know. Carl offered her all sorts of money to impersonate herself, but she refused. <clears throat> now we cut to the real Anne, dancing in a chorus line and stepping out of it as if in a dream. In the full version, we will see her next at, 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 at a play that is clearly the comedy that Driscoll claimed to be writing for her on the ship, where some of the female parts are taken by female impersonators. Anne is dissatisfied and leaves. She wants to find her true love. Deprived of the real Anne, Kong revives to full fury, breaks his chain, chains, drives everyone from the theater, leaps into the theater balcony, where he sees Driscoll, and decides that, once again, <clears throat> Driscoll is keeping him from his love. He breaks through the front of the theater and raging through Times Square, goes looking for every blonde he sees, picking them up, looking at them, and throwing them down on the street, searching for Anne. The military is called out. Anne comes out of the deluxe theater. I would have to go looking for details again to find out if the deluxe is either the, is either the theater where she was working in the prologue before she encountered Denim either with her older friend Manny, or where she went to get a burlesque job when she decides she has not fallen to that level just yet. Neither one would surprise me, but these are the kinds of detailed critical questions the French form raises endlessly, however they are answered. Driscoll goes after Kant, who presumably he realizes looking for Anne too, he must save her once more in the wildest landscape of all, the one secreted by the animal man. Kong and Anne encounter in the streets. But now the military is called out en masse. Briefly, Kong and Anne escape from the center of specular, cap specular capitalism, Times Square and 42nd Street, and take refuge in Central Park where, ideally happy among the trees and Christmas lights, Kong slips and slides around with her around the ice. She and Kong can both ignore the cold and simply satisfy each other by gazing at one another. Only then does a military shell shatter the ice behind him, 
and calm as a blonde white woman still in his grip, swings over the roofs of New York back to the specular center of Midtown New York to climb above it all by means of the white phallus at 34th Street, the Empire State Building. It is no accident that in the 1976 remake, the World Trade Center replaces the Empire State Building when Khan climbed to the top <coughs> with Jessica Lange, the same building that was attacked by terrorists and brought down in 2001, and then, rather idiotically, rebuilt recently as a single tower once more in order to facilitate the whole drama playing out again, <laughs> whether in art or in life. We never learn. In Lacanian terms, both Anne and the Empire State Building are the two faces of the phallus, which Kong will be destroyed for having mastered. I'm going to use the natural caesurus in our argument to talk directly about science fiction. There is a term that has crept into a lot of amateur discussions of science fiction over the last couple of decades that I, that, uh, I confess baffles me. World building. It is a term which simply never passed through my head while I was writing any of my several novels, whether set on planets, in this, or in any other solar system. The kinds of relationships that I have been discussing up till now really are the, <clears throat> the order of relationship I feel most concerned about, along with another roster of relationships, whether uh, uh, whether in Theodore Sturgeon, or Alfred Bester, <coughs> or Henri de Balzac, Gustave Flaubert, or even Victor Hugo. Relations between characters from different social stratas seem to make the most interesting stories. My sense is that if you have trouble coming up with a coherent world for a story, this is tantamount to saying you don't have much talent for writing science fiction. <laughs> Similarly, in the Clarion Workshop of Imaginative Fiction, I taught more or less every other summer since its inception in 1967. One of its sacros sacrosanct traditions is that each student was expected to write a complete SF story every week, which strikes me as insane. I couldn't do it. I don't know why students should be expected to. Even the story notes on Theodore Sturgeon, not only one of the greatest SF story practitioners, but one of the few who is a great American short story writer, period, talks of nine days to write this one, six weeks to write that one, with legendary periods of writer's block up to several years between various attempts. The notion that the production of truly good writing can be operationalized like that strikes me as loopy. Worlds are built of images disciplined by ideas. That feels to me like an idea of mind. The universe is built not of atoms, but of stories. That was written on a church bulletin board that I passed on Central Park West in New York City more than a decade ago, where I saw it out the bus window, and that has stayed with me ever since. Consider the two worlds built in two stories. The doors of his face, the lamps of his mouth, by Roger Zelazny. I start with a quote from the text. The lowlands of Venus lie between the thumb and forefinger of the continent known as Hand. Next, you study Hand to lay its illusions. The thumb is too short and curls like the embryo tail of Kate Horn. In most readers' minds, and with any, familiar, any familiarity with maps of Earth, Hand begins to look like the tail end of Africa. This is a Venus that is a fantasy landscape covered with water and few islands and clouds and a few small continents emerging. Next story, In the Bull, by, Varley, by John Varley. Though how they were able to distinguish a desert from anything else on Venus was still a mystery to me. I did find out how Venusians define desert, though. A desert is a place not yet inhabited by human beings. So, lo so long as I was able to board, board a scheduled blimp, I wasn't there yet. 
This is a Venus that is much closer to scientific to a, to a scientific picture. But the notion of bright sun is, of course, completely misleading because the five clouds of hydrocarbon oil that make up the atmosphere keeps out pretty much all visible light except the infrared. The title story comes from the following facts. The title of the story in the book comes from the following facts. I don't like standing in the bottom of a bowl a thousand kilometers wide. That's what you see. No matter how high you climb or how far you go, you are still standing in the bottom of that bowl. It has something to do with the bending of the light rays by the thick atmosphere, which as I reminded you, as we all know, in reality is not water, it's clouds of hypercarbon oil, if I understand ever the character of the story correctly. Then there's the sun. When, it was, when I was there, it was nighttime, which means the sun was, squashed, was a squashed ellipse hanging just above the horizon in the east, where it had set weeks and weeks ago. Don't ask me to explain it. All I know is that the sun never sets on Venus. Never. No matter where you are. It just gets flatter and flatter and wider and wider till it oozes around the north or south depending on where you are, becoming a flat, bright line of light until it begins pulling itself back together in the west, where it is going to rise in a few weeks. The visible wet world provides a fantasy image for Roger Zelazny. A visible desert world provides a fantasy image for John Varley. The ideas that Varley has to employ to discipline his image, however, are by far more complex. Let us return to Jackson's remake of the 1933 SF movie, King Kong. The one character on the venture, the animal capturing boat turned film ship, who does not follow the allegory that the script itself sets out in terms of the classic French style structure, is Billy, played by Jamie, Ball, uh, Jamie Bell. Billy's backstory is this. He was found in a boat that had come from some place and some terrible thing had happened to the boy when he was eight or nine. He has never been able to talk about it. At this point, Ben Hayes and the other sailors don't even question him. They assume he doesn't really remember. But because of a few bo broken bones the boy had, Ben Hayes at the very least assumes it must have been awful if only because the boy won't talk about it. Anyone who has ever read an adventure story, no story before, knows that the boy must have come from Skull Island. And what's more, is hiding something that will later be a key to their success once they get there, when he is jarred into articulation by whatever event, building, or happening. So we sit back waiting for it, assuming it will be provided with more or less elegant cleverness. But we, want the world, but we want the world to be coherent. In adventures, the world is. Otherwise, there's no narrative reason for having the backstory in the first place. Adventures don't have, adventures don't have red herrings, but put there by chance. They have them put there by design from the baddies, whoever they turn out to be. Even if the baddie is entirely a natural force, there have to be humans entailed with, some, with it somehow, as there are the natives that steal Anne from the boat. Ah, uh, so they were people. Pe so they were the people who brutalized the young Billy, and that's why when the ship goes to rescue Anne, he is so determined to get back to the natives who once were so awful to him and from whom he has just escaped with his life. Even adventures tend for, for the form of French narrative stuff, you know, the French style narrative. What will finally make it work or not is how elegant or witty or moving the one scene or three scenes, one on the boat and two on the island, each with its quarter page of dialogue and camera emphasized visuals to support it, to support it, this is all presented on the screen. It's called a subplot. And you have to resolve it for the same reasons you set it up. But as you suddenly, but if you suddenly decide 
at the production meeting that you don't want to resolve it because it takes too much time or distracts away from the main story, then you cut it out along with all its setup and make the character simply a more or less engaging walk-on with nothing particular about his position as cabin boy. Other cabin boys have been characters in adventures without being beat up and brutalized when there's children on off-stage mysterious islands. But Jackson's King Kong does exactly the wrong thing. Minutes after we get the story of Billy's childhood mystery, in another scene, we hear another story that happened years ago. We've already been thinking about Skull Island because the four demands we do. This story, however, is directly about Skull Island. Another boat was encountered with a dying adult in it. He definitely was Skull from Skull Island. He too was the victim of something awful. He too was not talking about it. Oh, that just means I was right about Billy, the audience thinks. And I certainly did so, not only the first time I saw it, but the second and third time as well. So that the eventual lack of resolution to Billy's character, uh, uh, resolution to Billy's character arc, only becomes more and more striking with each reviewing. I say this is exactly the wrong thing to do, doubling the introductory scene, because it also makes some of the more sophisticated viewers think, oh, maybe this is an adventure isn't an adventure after all. Billy himself will say that, holding up his 20s library edition of Heart of Dark Darkness. It's one of the first ones I ever saw in a library in the 1950s. Could it this be a slightly clumsy setup for a French-style narrative? It only looks like a coincidence as all things go on and we get to Skull Island, instead of just the return of the vicious natives as a prompt to Billy, re Billy's revenge, both for what they did to him when he was young and what they are currently doing to Anne, which I can see being more than a little racist, and which is a pro the kind of thing that Jackson himself might not, not like to get entailed in. Could it be a setup for an explanation with some psychological nuance? Coincidences in life happen all the time. There are no coincidences in fiction. In life, coincidences are the sign of nature sometimes indulging in meaningless repetition. In fiction, adventure or French, repetitions are the source of all meanings. Repetition means that humans have been there and left their signs. In Kahn, we are given two similar occurrences. A few years or months apart, in the same part of the ocean, they might well be random events. Probably in life, that's what they would be. In a story, we want them to be a story, a good story. That is why we assume the writer chose to tell it, to recount it uh, if it was real, to devote energy and time to making it up if it was imaginary. Now an audience, especially a popular mass audience, will go to such a work happy as to unravel from it, not the significance it has, but rather the significance they hope it has, and have been led to by the best works of the genre he hopes, uh, he, uh, he genre to hope such hopes. That is part of the reception structure of popular genres. And I even think it's a better structure than encouraging a mass audience through incompetence or over complexity to take from it anything they want. Though I know I am one step away from sounding like a condescending fascist. I really believe the purpose of art, all art, whether popular or the most sophisticated or refined, is to use the skill, sensitivity, creativity, and observation of the world that we, that we currently assume is the case to create an object that allows an audience to critique its own hopes and feelings. In popular art, this is always mediated, and the particular version of this mediation we call subversion, by what is most efficiently commercial. In all academic art, these goals are constantly mediated, subverted, by what is most easily teachable. A few years ago, coming out of Spider-Man 4, 
I asked a 16 year old, a 16 or 17 year, year, 17, uh, year old New York Latino, also coming into the lobby, what did you think of the movie? Oh man, he answered with a dismissive grin. It was terrible. I mean, what kind of hero is that? All he does is cry from one end of the film to the other. <laughs> and he hardly hits anybody. <laughs> I was a little surprised, but not much. I'd actually enjoyed it, uh, though not enough, as they say, to write home about it. But the moment I got his critique, I realized that Spider-Man 4 had been an incompetent betrayal of a religious hero. That's what I'd enjoyed been able to enjoy because of what I had brought to the movie, which I'm pretty sure from his critique was not what the young man had brought to it that early summer Friday morning. But just before I left, I asked him because I was ju it just popped into my head, hey, did you ever see Peter Jackson's King Kong that came out, oh, seven or eight years ago now? Yeah, I saw that one. I thought it was pretty good. And we reached the head of the escalator to go down to street level. I got on and he dashed down the steps ahead, and, uh, beside and ahead of me. Now, as you know, I happen to think King, uh, King Kong was a great film. But to explain why, I have to note something about the young man's critique there in the movie lot, uh, or both of them. Before he disappears forever from this piece, take stock of what he did not say. He did not say of either the one he had just seen or the one he had seen an indeterminate number of years before, either when it came out when he, and he was eight or sometime since on DVD, Netflix, or TV. He did not say of either. What I really missed, however, was a young Latino male who was put in the film so that I could have someone to identify with. One could have easily thought that his enjoyment of one and his disapproval of the other were both based on the fact that like the bearded black gay professor who walked with a cane and was too infirm, certainly even to walk down the steps, much less run down them the way he did, and who also missed a gay, uh, and who, ha who also hadn't missed a black gay hero in either one, came from his understanding of the genres, just the way mine had. Nor am I interested in taking away either his disapproval or his pleasure in either. Now, I do think Jackson's film is one of the popular culture achievements of the first decade and a half so far of, this, of the century. Uh, I can reel off a general list of reasons, especially vis-a-vis -vis Spider-Man, without even trying. <laughs> King Kong is a film which is predicated on the situation that everyone in the movie, from the hero and heroine, Adrian Brody, uh, Jack, Driscoll, Jack Driscoll, and Naomi Watts, and Darrow, down to the most tertiary, tertiary en passant characters running around screaming and trying to get away from Kant on Broadway are all pushed out of their comfort zones by the greater power uh, that, that by the greater power than expected from the chain Kant himself. That's lifted straight from Cooper's version, uh, of, uh, of course. But what does Jackson add to the film? Both the sexist cliché about women and the racist costumes and visions of native dancers that were part of the original in 1933 are presented in the 2005 version as clichés meant to hide the reality of 30s depression life from the people. As well, from the top to the bottom of the hierarchy of characters on the venture, from the film people down to the crew, examples are chosen and given more or less rich story arcs that are pretty carefully sketched. And there is a black character on the crew, the first mate Hayes, uh, Evan uh, Parks, heirs at his father to, uh, to orphan cabin boy Billy, Jamie Bell. And I appreciate that. Also, he was, uh, also Parks was a soldier who had been badly treated at the end of World War I. One presumed it had caused him to take up his roving life and single parenthood on the sea instead of opting for a family and middle class comforts on land. Hayes is, at least at a glance that only takes in the surface, a hero and a tragic one. If there is a woman's life connected to his lingering somewhere in the off-screen backstory, the life of a woman, either tragic or triumphant, it is not referred to in the script. And certainly we don't see it or her at any time on screen. 
This is something I tried to lift structurally from Jackson as I lifted it, the title of Through the Valley of the Nest of Spiders from his film Tet. It was precisely something that was not in the original King Kong and had been left on the cutting room floor and only retrieved by Jackson and retrieved in two versions, in two bursts, as it were, of con concerted the Geisterer. While I had tried to urge each of its borrowed elements, black father, white off fork and son, closer to an observed reality from my own life, a reality, a reality that inflected and in fact actually creates their meaning in my text. That makes a meaning specifically different from Jackson's. And what about Billy himself? Certainly, he is the character that Jackson gives both the young Latino I exchanged my few critical questions with in the lobby after Spider-Man, and indeed me, and anyone else who understands the genre to identify with, at least once we have enjoyed the efforts of Adrian Brody to play a writer who, once moved out of his comfort zone, by a fluke of nature, has to play a largely, largely physical hero, whether uh, nowhere near as interesting, <coughs> interesting as the one he would like to write about, if he were left to his own devices. And we enjoyed Naomi, Wa Naomi Watts having to clown and do black foot and do backflips and pratfalls and otherwise play step and fetch it for the enjoyment of big black <coughs> gorilla, who has kidnapped her pretty much the same way she had to play the sexist roles of Jack for roles for Jack Black, Carl Denham, who pretty much kidnapped her from Western civilization as we know it, right at the beginning. The first one Watts wants to do and wants to do badly. And with the help of borrowed clothes, a CGI sunset, she does it. And pretty well, we are all supposed to agree. And I did. The second one with Kong, she knows how to do. According to the script, she does it well. It's what she's been doing to survive. Now it's what she has to do in darkest Africa to survive. The major difference between the two is that this pantomime is exa exhausting, both for her and for Kong. At the end, when she tells the big ape, OK, that's it. I can't do anymore. That's all there is. He gently knocks her down as if to tell her, tell her, no, that's what you say. You can do some more. I said so in my own inarguable way. Cut. On the other side, we find both Watts and Kong asleep. Watts curled up in Kong's hand. Kong snoring like a quiet locomotive. As Adrian, the writer turned hero, sneaks up on them, and, uh, observing them in the leaves, wondering how to effect a reasonable, believable rescue. As is the entire film, it's pretty choice irony. The setups are so rich with residences, it almost doesn't matter how they resolve. Like Hitchcock before him, Jackson realizes his major aesthetic job in terms of the genre is to make each interim resolution spectacular and surprising. So that even if you have the general progression of plot from your memory of the Cooper version, the sheer visual intensity and technological virtuos virtuosity of the image construction of the resolution se sequence, whatever it is, will <coughs> surprise you, but keep you will surprise you, but keep you intellectually satisfied, not in the least. It will start you laughing again. What you are laughing over is the tension between the fact that it is so unbelievable and yet is done so well. And once more, who is Billy? He is the foster son of a black father. He dances his ass off in an Irish jig on deck with Anne and the other sailors, visually reinforcing his friendship with her so that it's believable when he wants to go along with the adult sailors when they take off with their guns to find him. The white goddess the natives have absconded with. Fascist or not, Billy's film in context, the whole of his situational surround, means that joining the guys with the gun, guns 
is not just a fuck you to the natives we'll eventually see acted out. In fact, we don't. His father, his dancing, his reading of Conrad need, means that he is just not one of the hollow men firing off the bow at the primitives on shore. He loves her, as does Carl himself. Billy is also, remember, the one who tells the audience this is a serious film in, uh, for all its yucks. At the same time, he also tells the literary, tells, tells the literary revelation to his black father, who confirms its truth for both Billy and the audience. He is the one who mourns his dead black father on the floor of the valley of the nest of spiders, and whose mourning, mourning, M O U R N, mourning, joins that of Andy Circus, Circus for the dead Chinese lover, for his dead Chinese lover, along with the grief any of the audience might bring to the film, for any of its thousands of extinguished species that have been obliterated in this continuing greatest extinction of species since the Parmian Triassic itself. I'm talking about the one we are in the middle of now. The echoes of all such grief, whether it's for the dozen other sailors who have fallen in and into the valley, or the never holy silence echoes of that morning that gather into the rage of Kong himself as, freed by his own strength, strength from the captivity of civilization, a grief that carried Watts and Circus has come through a moving dance on the ice in Central Park and then up the Empire State Building itself, where he is menaced by the military and the constabulary combined, who would rescind his chance to love Anne Darrow, a rage still supported by grief for the wrongly fallen military or the deluded police on the streets of the city or in the skies above it, for the victims of poverty and starvation or the animals whose antics in the zoo are supposed to entertain us and which we saw in the film's first faux documentary seconds and which we are to recall each time we see the unfettered cunning who is being hunted and destroyed because his pursuers can't distinguish the difference between loving and wanting to love and the satisfaction both provide in the presence of the person or object loved. I forgot one last thing about Billy. His origins are a mystery, and that mystery is announced and preserved by a formal mistake in the filmic structure. How neat is that? He could be Kong's brother just as easily as he could throw a gas bomb to help with Kong's capture, which included the original prop from the 1933 version that Jackson had collected over the years and kept on set for his own version. This was, some, this was a film that he wanted to do for a long, long time. But the, 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 the damage, the subversion has already been done. And if some of it isn't as effective as it might have been, it doesn't matter, really. Not as long as someone can do another rewrite, another remake. Still, all I can say is that Jackson's is pretty damn good. Another reason I am here discussing all this is because six students in this room, and we just heard from one of them, uh, uh, have been reading my work in class. They generated three fresh questions that, generously, their instructor, Lavelle Porter, asked me to address. I'm only going to try, to, uh, try two of them. The more I thought about them, the more difficult they seem. First, what is it about science fiction that makes it right for exploring topics such as sexuality, gender, and race? Second, what made you so passionate about writing, and what would you say is the most important factor that pushed you to write as much as you have? The truth, however, is I don't know if I can give them the kind of positive answer that might satisfy you. That would provide the kind of grounding we might all be happier if I could sketch out. The reason in all cases is because we are dealing with art, and art often just does not yield up the positivist answers we keep putting towards it. 
to repeat the first question. What is it about science fiction that makes it right for exploring topics such as sexuality, gender, and race? The only answer I can give is nothing. <laughs> Other than the fact that it is a species of language, and language can talk about pretty much anything. Beyond that, nothing that I know makes it particularly apt for any of those topics other than any topics, uh, for any of those topics than any other. Science fiction is a genre, and as such, it is a set of tools, like oil paints. The question has the same form as, what makes oil paints particularly right for painting Renaissance nudes, or seaside sunsets, or cityscapes in the evening, or even abstract expressionist patterns and blobs. I deal with these topics in my work because that's what my experience of the world and of the genres that I have been exposed to leads me to want to reflect on and inflect. I deal with sexuality, gender, and race because these things have come to the fore in my own time, and I, like others, have felt they were important. It's because they impinge on my life, and I have a generic tool, a language, to deal with them. To repeat the second, what made you so passionate about writing, and what would you say is or are the most important factors that pushed you to write as much as you have? What made me so passionate about writing was probably my general education before I started publishing. I had been writing and, however awkwardly, trying to do it seriously since I started high school. But what made me passionate is a mystery, and the answer is the one that allows us to develop a passion about anything. Because now and again throughout my life, I have had passions about this, that, or the other, I can only say I feel very lucky. Some of them were about sex. Some were about job, gender, some were about writing, race, some were about writing itself. That I have felt some passions in my life and uh, about that I have felt some passions about life and about art has made life a little more interesting than it might have been. And that now and again some readers have wanted to teach, reread, or understand what I wrote enough to go back and reread it, or even invite me to talk to you, makes me feel luckier still. Thank you very much. Uh, so we have time for just a couple of questions. If anybody yeah, has yeah. questions. I, by the way, I will wing anything. No one can debate. I will consider any question, although I may say no. <laughs> That's the answer. You're one of the people. Do you want to call people to help? Have to uh, take the microphone from here. Okay. There's one. We start with that. And okay. So, yeah. So I appreciate what you were saying about world building. Um, and so I'm curious what you think about, um, since you were talking about King Kong versus Spider-Man, what you think about the, the sort of Marvel cinematic universe and the use to which it's been put where it can fit everything in. You have Thor, you have Black Panther, you know, you, you've got all different kinds of science fiction modalities sort of working inside one thing as opposed to what I think you're describing, Peter Jackson is trying to do, is to sort of rework it again and again. So I'm just curious as to what you think about that kind of world building, for lack of a better term, versus the sort of Peter Jackson rewriting or revision of. They're going to give you a workout. Uh, I think it's overstuffed. Uh, is basically what's wrong. Uh, I think it doesn't work as well as they hope it does, and I think it is because it's just over stuff. Um, uh, I think um, they could. I think they could look at things a little bit more closely. 
Um, the way this kind of thing has driven out, dare I say it, more serious films, that I think is a tragedy. That I think is a real tragedy. I think um, um, the, the changes that have come into uh, films because of the rise of um, the way the way quote sci-fi films, and I don't notice I don't say science fiction. Uh, I say sci-fi films um, have displaced um, um, other kinds of films. I think is is, is weird and a loss. And I would like to see. I would like to see more. I would like to see more films that relatively related to the world that is the case. I really would. And I think one of the nice things about the Peter Jackson side of King Kong is because it is a film that relates both to films, i.e., and it also relates to the world that was the case. You know, that is, that is the case in a very interesting way. <clears throat> in a way that is, uh, in a way that his Lord of the Rings films, which I think are pretty good, uh, uh, the, uh, those in the Harvard don't. I just had an observation about the question that had come about why sci-fi might be better for race, gender, blah, 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 blah. I don't know why sci-fi as a literary thing uh, is, has that role, but for media and television, it has a very s distinct role. Sci-fi allows you to take a world and make this place that has a very specific background and thing that's isolated from our society. So you can go in and you can clear, clearly talk about a topic in isolation and bring it out and talk about it. And when people like Rod Serling were doing the Twilight Zone and stuff, he was infuriated that the censors wouldn't let him do more stories and things. He invented the Twilight Zone so he could talk in social commentary about things and they ignored it because it was just that sci-fi stuff. It's fantasy. It isn't real. And it was a backdoor way to get social commentary into media and television. Yes. <laughs> Maybe one more question? One more? Okay. Oh, it's okay. I don't need the mic. I guess I just wanted to ask, you spoke about how your life experience influenced your passion and the writing you've done. And I know that you spent a brief time at CUNY of the City College. And I was wondering if you could say um, anything about the influence perhaps that's had on your experiences in your work, if any, perhaps for the, and what it's like to return to CUNY to speak here today. Well, what what my time at, at CUNY, which was a long time ago, uh, did well. It, um, um, the general trajectory of my education was very was was was, was well. Uh, maybe it wasn't so odd. Um, I started off at a very private progressive school called Dalton. I then went to a specialized school, a uh, public school, uh, called um, Bronx High School of Science. Um, the most, the, the, the biggest change um, from Dalton to Bronx High School of Science um, was I had gone from a class where, a, a school where if the, if the classes got over more than 12 people in them, there was what they call a, a meeting. You know, a, a parent teacher, I mean, what are we going to do about this horrible situation? To a, cl a class where there were 45 people in the, in, in the class on my first day. Um, and then uh, from there, uh, then I went to uh, City College um, and didn't finish. I didn't, didn't finish. Um, um, and I just, I dropped out of college. Um, I did not drop out of college because I couldn't, uh, because I thought I didn't, I knew more than that. I, I dropped out of college with my tail between my legs. I thought I was a fool. I thought I could not do this. This, this was beyond me to do. Uh, um, no one had sat down with me and, you know, and told me how you did it. You had to do it by organizing your time. <laughs> you know, uh, and nobody did, uh, did, uh, explained it. I was, I was just all over the place. Um, and um, I then, I later wrote a piece on that, which will be in my, my if I have another collection of essays, the piece that I, I wrote on how to do that. Uh, is you know is uh, um, will be in it, uh, and uh, you know and and I also didn't realize that it was something that was it was done to me by the system, which was another thing, uh, and 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 that was better. 
So um, um, I did find that it, it worked better for me trying to organize my own time in my own way rather than to organize it in a way somebody else said. And when I, once I did try to start organizing it in my own way, I started, I, I continued writing novels. I didn't start writing novels. I've been writing them, I've been trying to write them since I was 13. You know, but I continued writing them. Uh, and they actually got published. Uh, and so that's what worked better. And so I found that I had to kind of get away from the standard way of, of doing it. And so, so I, I learned, I learned, I learned that this was, I learned that the educational system was a system that was not set up, it was not set up for people with severe ADD, which is what I've got, you know, it was not set up for people like that. Um, and so that's what I, you know, what I learned. Um, I think, let's give uh, Professor Gillian another round of applause for this excellent talk.